Um, as he said, I'm Deborah Hannes. Uh, I'm a PhD student at Harvard University. And today we're going to talk about how to deal with missing data. Um, my path to this project involved, um, I graduated from MIT with a double degree in computer science and brain and cognitive sciences. I spent a year as a Fulbright scholar in Cambodia learning about how education translates into job creation, uh, particularly in technology. And then I got a job in San Francisco as an early engineer at a startup. And then I decided to quit life and become a PhD student, uh, where I'm now a PhD student studying machine learning at Harvard. So as for today, we're going to start by talking about how to identify different types of missing data. We'll go through an example uh, using a project that I've been working on uh, to help physicians uh, prescribe medications more effectively and efficiently. And then we'll talk about how we dealt with missing data in that example. So to start off with, we'll talk about identifying the particular type of missing data. So there are three types of missing data. Data which is missing at random, missing not at random, and data missing completely at random. Um, and if you haven't heard those terms before, they probably sound like exactly the same thing. So uh, I'll spend the next few minutes going more into depth about what each of those mean. So first we'll talk about data missing at random. This means that the events that led to the missing data occurred at random, but the probability that the data is missing is dependent on other variables. So an example might be the likelihood of a test being performed might depend on the patient's health insurance. So if we're looking at a bunch of test data across different patients, um, we're not going to have uh, that particular test for a patient if the patient has not taken the test. And one reasonable reason to not get a test is if your insurance doesn't cover the test. Um, so the assumption here that would make this data missing at random is if the patients selected their insurance randomly, which you can tell might be a bit of a stretch. A lot of people don't choose their insurance randomly. So that's an example of how we need to be careful about when we're labeling our data as any of these. And be very, and particularly I think the most important thing is to just be very explicit about what assumptions you are making because chance, there's a good chance that um, your assumptions won't be perfect and there will be some bias in your data. So uh, it's good to just document how you're thinking about it. The second type of missing data is data missing not at random. So this means that the probability of the variable being missing might depend on itself. So let's say I go in to get my blood pressure tested and I have uh, normal blood pressure. Every one of my family has normal blood pressure. I'm probably not going to get my blood pressure tested again for a while because it's not that important. Whereas if I have a test and I have high blood pressure, I'm much more likely to get tested frequently to see if that's something that's improving. Um, so frequently you might have missing data um, based on the type of data that you're collecting like that. And finally, there is the holy grail, which all of us want, which is data missing completely at random. So this means that the event that lead to the missing data actually occurred completely at random. It's just like you have a complete data set and you just decided to ignore a few of them. You can still draw all of the exact same conclusions um, because your data set is just a little smaller. There's no reason why that data was missing. Um, so in this case, the fact whether or not the test is done just uh, doesn't depend on anything. Okay, so now we're going to start in moving into the example. We have this case study where we're modeling missing data to predict HIV treatments. To start off with, I'm going to just go over some vocabulary to make sure we're on the same page. Um, HIV is a potential precursor to AIDS. 
uh, meaning that if you're HIV positive, that doesn't mean uh, that you have AIDS. That just means that you need good treatment, and with appropriate treatment, you might never have AIDS, and your immune system can stay at a reasonably healthy level. One common way that this is treated is called structured treatment interruption. So in this case, the patient is given some cocktail of drugs that is cycled on and off. And during the on periods when the patient is being treated, they actually feel awful because they're really intense drugs that are attacking everything, the good and the bad. And it's during the off periods that their immune system gets better. So in a successful structured treatment interruption, the patient will go in, get a drug, and then they'll get a little bit less of that drug. And then eventually, during these off periods, the immune system will get better, and the treatments will get farther and farther apart so they can essentially live a normal, healthy life, only being treated periodically. So to get a healthy patient, it's important that we choose the sequence of drugs carefully. So the way we do this in this particular case is we use a reinforcement learning algorithm. So in reinforcement learning, you define you have the environment, which is the world, and you define a state space. And this is uh, why we need humans for reinforcement learning algorithms, to define a good state space that really describes the attributes of the environment that we care about. And then we define a set of actions, which is how we will interact with the environment in a way that could potentially change our state. And then we have our goal, we have some reward function, which is the other reason why we need humans, which, is defi which defines uh, what exactly we care about and how we're going to make this better. So to bring this back into the medication domain, in this case, the states are these personal health indicators. So the patient goes in, they get a blood test, you can look at a certain volume of blood, and you can count the number of free virus particles, the number of healthy macrophages, the number of infected macrophages. And there are some health indicators that indicate that the patient is getting sicker. There are some indi that indicate that they're getting better. And then the actions are what drugs we apply to make the patient more healthy. And the reward tells us how well our actions are working. And our goal is to get as, patient, as, as healthy of a patient as possible uh, and that is, and so we need to maximize the reward function and get an optimally healthy patient. So just to delve a little bit deeper, we have the states, which are the personal health indicators. So there are good things like healthy macrophages and bad things like infected macrophages. Um, and on balance, we can figure out how healthy the patient is from these. There are the actions, which are the drugs that get applied. In this case, a protease inhibitor and reverse transcriptase inhibitor are very common ways of treating it. Or they get both drugs, or they get none. And in this case, the reward is a linear combination of the states um, with some constants and coefficients that make it so that you can generally think of it as as the patient gets more healthy, the reward is increased. As they get less healthy, the reward is decreased. And we maximize the reward function. So, how does this work? It turns out it works amazingly. Um, this plot here shows uh, the reward function over a period of time, assuming the patient comes in for treatment every five days, so 1,000 days, 200 treatment periods. Uh, the blue line indicates a random policy, so that is the patient comes in once every five days and they just get handed a drug without anyone looking at the state space. And the second is uh, this using, is the reward using this reinforcement learning function. And you can see that it performs quite a bit better. Uh, so that's awesome. Are we done? Um, it would be great if we were done. And actually a paper was published on this, so some people were done at this point. Um, however, uh, they did make some sort of unrealistic assumptions, so this is not implemented in any clinics anywhere yet. And one of the concerns is that the patient has to go to the hospital for full treatment and testing every five days, which, if you don't live right next to a hospital, is really hard. 
I mean, if you have to rely on public transportation or you have an hourly job or you're taking care of family members or maybe you live in a neighborhood which is far, is far away from a hospital, there are all sorts of reasons for this to not work and for patients to not come in once every five days. So in an ideal scenario, we have something that looks like this where a patient comes in with these evenly time space periods. Um, but to make this more realistic, we said, what if instead we make this more like real life and the patient just comes in randomly? Um, so I'm a patient, I come in Monday, I come in 10 days from now, I come in two days from that. Um, and then we also looked at another type of data, which is we put a few more restrictions on it where we said, what if we have these paired data sets where like I'm a patient, I come in Monday, I come in five days later on Friday, and then I come in some random period of time after that. Um, so then what kind of missing data do you think these are? And this is a really hard question. So I'll answer it for you. Um, to remind you, these are the three types of data. And I'll give you a couple seconds to think about it. In this case, we masked out the data completely randomly. So you might think that it's missing completely at random. But we masked, masked out the data, particularly trying to imitate data which is missing at random. So whether or not the patient comes in is dependent on all sorts of other factors, some of which might be random. It might be how far away they live from the hospital. So we can assume that people with HIV are randomly distributed, although that is also a bit of a stretch. <laughs> Um, it could be on, you know, how, and uh, these factors like how close they are to public transportation and things like this. So we'll say that we're modeling data which is missing at random, although, once again, this is an assumption that we should be explicit about because later we might find out that it's not actually not missing at random. So there are a lot of ways that we can deal with missing data given this. So remember, we have this time series. Um, we have data about the patient at any given point. So first of all, the first thing which we probably want to do because it's the easiest is if we do have that case where data is missing completely at random, then we can just ignore the missing points. But that's not this case. So we can't do that here. Another thing that we could do, which is fairly simple, is we can assume that the data is missing in some specific way. And then we can use some form of interpolation. So in this case, each state is just a number. Remember, it's like the count of macrophages or the count of free virus particles. And it is on a time series. So we can just use linear interpolation between the state that we know at one point and the state that we know at another point. And we can assume that the point in the center is somewhere in the middle. Um, so you all probably have seen this at some point a long time ago. But you know, if we have this, something like this, and we have this point, we want to know exactly what it is. We assume it's linear. And we can get um, those values there. So next, another way of dealing with this is imputation, which is a little bit more complicated. So you can assume that there's some probability distribution over each of the unknown states. So in this case, this plot is showing uh, a time series with two points that we know. Those are the ones that are in black with the lines and a whole bunch of points that we don't know. So we can say that, so what we did is we said that there's some, the points that we don't know are going to fall within some sort of normal distribution and the variance will increase uh, quadratically at each time point. So at the point right after the first state, we'll have some Gaussian distribution. And then the next one, we'll have an even bigger Gaussian distribution because we don't know where exactly in the first Gaussian distribution the actual data was. And so we get all these Gaussian distributions going forward, which are getting bigger and bigger, and then we sample from each of those, and we sample going backwards, and we get some point. And then 
We do the th same thing with the weights which define the transition between the states. And then we sample the states again. And here we've actually gotten some kind, we've actually gotten a form of expectation maximization where we sample what we're looking at and uh, a variable that it's related to to get the inferred states and weights. So how did this work for us? Um, it worked somewhat well. Um, so once again, the blue line is the random policy. That's where we don't even look at the states. Um, the red line is the paired data, and the purple line is the sparse data, where we just come in randomly at any given point. And the green line indicates what it looks like with a complete data set as a baseline, where we had no missing data. Um, another way that we could deal with this is we can think about developing some sort of dynamic model to describe this. So once again, this requires a bit more thought of figuring out, not just making assumptions, but also figuring out why, why exactly this data is missing. Um, one, idea, one possibility is there might, be, there might be more systematic reasons. For example, a patient might only come in for treatment when they're not feeling well. Or they might not always take their medication because sometimes the medication has really bad side effects and uh, you don't want to take that medication when you have something important going on. Um, so we can develop a more systematic way of describing this. Um, one way of using this, um, which we're going to be looking at soon, is uh, using a more modeling it using some sort of more dynamic probability distribution. So in this case, um, we're going, looking at a, a Gaussian process. So you can see that this shows, um, there's some, the blue shows some large probability, some large area which the data might fall into. And then there are, the red points show the observed points, so we know exactly where that distribution is at those points. And then, uh, given those points, you can develop some sort of prediction over where it is going to be. And there are a lot of things that you can vary with, a lot of parameters you can vary in the distribution in order to get something that fits uh, your idea of how things should work. Um, so that's one way to look at this, but there are, there are lots of other more dynamic models which uh, you can use to, go, um, to model your missing data. So, to recap, what we've done is we discussed some various types of missing data. Um, we've learned about this simulator that uses reinforcement learning to predict effective HIV treatments. And we've sort of developed a set of tools for dealing with that missing data. Um, I did this work with my advisor, Finale Doshi, a professor at Harvard, a uh, master's student in the Computational Science and Engineering Department and it was funded by the National Science Foundation in Harvard. And so, in conclusion, if you're faced with an incomplete data set, you can decide whether you want to ignore the data, or ignore, ignore the fact that the data is missing. Don't ignore the data. <laughs> but you, whether you want to ignore whether the data is missing, um, and just draw conclusions based as if the missing data is missing completely at random. Inter or in some cases, you can interpolate across various values, impute it, or develop a more complicated model. Um, any questions? Yes. Why is it squiggly? Yeah, I was just going to ask to explain sort of the plateau structure that we see there. Um, this is looking at an individual point. It's, um, later, what we ended up doing is we ended up averaging over all the points. But the wiggle is just a random variation. It's not important.
This is probably an oversimplistic question, but I feel the need to ask it anyway. Um, over the course of different instances where you've had to um, find an approach for missing data, what what of the four items you've outlined of ignore, interpolate, impute, and develop a model, which do you find yourself using most often? Um, I usually end up, I usually start with something like the interpolation or imputation if, I, if it's a type of data set where I can, um, just because it's a simple place to start <laughs> and it would be great if it worked. Um, but often I do end up moving on to developing a more complicated data model of how the data works together in order to actually answer the question effectively. <laughs> Uh, thank you. So um, based off of your model, you had sort of this uh, periodic function initially that you're sort of demonstrating right. and then, and then um, looking at that as a sampling problem. And so I'm curious um, if you could comment on some of the algorithms and methods of getting around, say, undersampling. So if, if you're not quite sampling at, say, twice the frequency, um, it's often a common problem that you're not going to see enough structure. Okay. Uh, I think... So I guess the question is, is what kind of... Could you comment on some of the machine learning algorithms that maybe in your experience have helped get around some of this undersampling, maybe like below, say for example, like the Nyquist frequency? Okay, um, I guess, I think it sounds like there might be a slight misunderstanding. Um, so we aren't doing any sampling with the, I assume this is what you're talking about. Um, there's actually no sampling going on here. Uh, this is a, sort of crude model of what the actions look like. So what quantity of drug they're getting at any given point. And then what we're doing is we're saying at each time step, um, the patient goes in, they get tested, so we get a measurement of the state. And then on the way out, the uh, doctor hands them a drug, which is the action. And then at that point, we have, can evaluate the reward function and pick the optimal function to get us maximize the reward for the next step. Um, this point where the sampling occurs is, um, so this is what the action looks like. And then, uh, the sampling occurs in the imputation only. So this, this is where we're doing the sampling. So we're, at this point, we're not necessarily looking at the actions for sampling. We just are, we're looking at the states, and then we're saying which of the four actions will maximize our reward to, and get us into the next state. Did that answer your question? Great. Yes. Um, we're hoping, I think we're hoping to do something like that soon. Um, one thing to note about this is all of the data that I've been showing you is simulated data. It's not from real HIV patients. Um, however, we're, and I expect when we do get data from real HIV patients, it might not immediately work very well with the simulator since it's making all of these assumptions. Um, but I think that once we get real data into this, we'll be able to do a lot more with that. I had one question. Um, the, the categories you gave for the kind of missing data, Yeah. if you didn't know much about how the data set was collected, do you, because it seems like it's more like a reasoning process, oh, maybe it's random, but 
is there a way to kind of test the data and say, well, this is probably random or this is probably biased? Or how, I mean, the categorization process, how do you do that? Yes. Um, I'd say if you know nothing about how the data is collected, it's very hard. Um, however, if you know even a little bit about how the data is collected, uh, you can usually reason a little bit about how, uh, what type of data it might be and what sort of complications may have come up. And then you can test whether the data is biased in the way that you think. Uh, so you, uh, I mean, this is all about sampling and then deciding to take an action and seeing what effect that action has. And is the fact that it's uh, made up that you have some algorithm that determines how the action affects the state that you can play with it, is that how you get the graphs of how your actions affect the state depending on the different models that you use? Or could you take a bunch of data from the past that's already happened and um, I don't know if that makes sense. <laughs> I think I understand the question. Um, right, so what's happening is we're getting some state, we're measuring what our state variables are, um, and then we have a reward function and we're saying what do we think is going to maximize the reward function. Um, and one way that we do that we can do that is by looking at previous data points, uh, you know, that are in a similar way, or occurred in a similar way. Um, so we can look at these previous data points and get an estimate of what we think the next act, which action will maximize our award, and then um, we take that action and measure the state again, um, and. Being able to maximize the reward function and figuring out what sequence we've done it in is dependent on being able to intervene with that action at periodic times. We can probably take one more question while we're changing uh, laptops. How does this translate to long-term um, life expectancy or, or change in diagno or, yeah, improvement. It, it seems like it's going to change their temporary this week, next week, but what about long term? Um, so this looks at um, how healthy the patient is at any given time, and it does require continuing intervention, um, but in an ideal scenario, the interruptions will become longer and longer such that the patient is not being treated for a long period of time and they need more infrequent treatment so that the patient can live mostly normally. Does that answer your question? If not, uh, we can talk more afterwards. <laughs> Thank you. All right, thank you. Thank you.